the Carlsberg Bay Mountains probably look a lot like the Drew. Not quite so much from this angle, but as seen from down by Montemur or even down in Valley Bottom, the west face is pretty much what you would get if you asked a small child to draw you a mountain. I've never seen a proper big mountain before. It's pretty much a perfect pointy pyramidal peak. We're here to climb the Drew Traverse, which is the easiest way up and down the mountain, but still no pushover. D plus ish, several pictures of 5C rock and a long old route with really complex route finding. And I'm not going to lie, I'm slightly apprehensive about it. It'll be one of the hardest things I've done. And you haven't got the safety net of endless fixed gear like you've got on many other big alpine peaks, which is partly why it's so alluring. It's still a pristine peak. There's not hundreds of meters of big fat shipping rope for you to follow. But yeah, it makes route finding even harder. It's probably a good thing being slightly apprehensive because overconfidence is definitely the helpless downfall. And yeah, I'd say I'm definitely on the right side of nervous about it. Looking forward to it, should be good. My climbing partner is a stronger rock climber than me. But I'm the more experienced alpinist, which is a good combination to have. He can be the rope gun on the crux pitches as I'm struggling, and I'll take charge of route finding and all the other logistics as well. So yeah, should make it up, should be fine. Fingers crossed. Like many alpine routes these days, finding it in optimal conditions is pretty damn difficult. Having nice dry rock, but still good conditions in the glacier. But conditions right now should be about as good as they can get. Just passed a team on the way down who said the conditions are fine. And yeah, seen plenty of action over the last few weeks, so everything should still go. Glacier should still be passable. Fingers crossed the, rope, the snow bridges are still intact by tomorrow morning. Most of the rock is now dry. I still expect to find some ice and snow up at the top, especially when you're on the north facing side. But yeah, shouldn't pose too much of an issue. So just need to decide if we carry our axe and crampons up or leave them at the bottom. Brand new Sharper hut It's just there. Opened up last year, but as I often do, we're going to bivvy. So in a minute, once my partner's got up here, I'm going to have to head up a little bit above the hut and try and find a bivvy spot. The area around this hut has got some of the best bivvy rings I've ever seen. We're just down there. I'll show you those in a sec. Can't bivvy here. There's a helipad. But the problem is, there's not actually any running water near here because we're on a bit of a rock buttress, so we've got to go quite far down that side or that side by looking for it to find water. Instead, I'm heading up. We passed a couple of really good fast flowing streams on the final section of the approach, just before you start the ladders up to the hut. I'd highly recommend, if you are planning to bivvy up here, fill up your water down there, because it's quite a way up to find any water. There's water everywhere, you can hear it, but it's over there. Nothing on this moraine ridge, obviously. Just doing a little reconnaissance for tomorrow while I'm up here. It's always a good thing to do a reconnaissance the night before when you can actually see where you're going. So, in days gone by, we've been able to just walk straight across the glass here, from here to the start of the route over there. But now, it seems like the way to go is up the snowfield on the right here. A couple of options, zigzagging up, try and cross this messy grassy thing in the middle somewhere just follow the footprints really shouldn't be too difficult and then come in from higher up traverse down to get to the snow ramp at the start of the route and then from there you decide whether you leave your crampons there or not the route continues along a relatively easy ter terrace that way Welcome to my bivvy site. You can't be fit three people here, four at a squeeze. I've got the whole thing to myself. James is another one, equally as big and cosy, just over there. Yeah, so many amazing bivvy spots up here. And while exploring the toilet facilities, shall we say, about 50 meters or so further that way, there's even a bivvy, bivvy ring with a wooden platform in it, which is like cut to measure as well. It's just probably, yeah, easily most comfortable bivvy spot I've ever seen in my life. That's it. Nothing else to do now except go to bed. That's the thing with alpinism, especially when you're bivvying. Once you've eaten tea, there's nothing else to do but sleep. Of course, you can enjoy the views, but yeah. My alarm's set for 2 a.m., which my phone takes great pleasure in telling me is in about six and a half hours now, so 
need to get some rest anyway, even though I'm not be able to sleep much yet because it's still full daylight. But at least we've got some shade down here, so yeah. A few hours half sleep. Might get a deep sleep if I'm lucky, but we're well rested anyway. It's pretty cozy here, pretty comfortable. So yeah, see you in the morning. to go. At least one more hard pitch but the end is in sight.
was the true summit of the Grand Jeu. Just up there, on the side of that flake. You get the impression most people who climb the Drew don't actually summit the Drew because there's loads of footprints heading down the snow ridge, but there was none heading up to the summit. So, yeah, it seems a shame to come all this way and not actually summit. But what a day! I'm absolutely exhausted. It's nearly 8 pm now. I think we started at 2 2 40 am. So, massive day, and we've still got to get down. It's just a small matter of at least 10 abseils, potentially 17, depending on where we go. But thankfully, they were all rebolted a year or so ago, so the anchors at least should be good. The rock might not be, but the anchors should be good. We did it. We survived the Drew. Finally got back to the bivvy about, well, probably after 5.30 a.m. this morning. That's over 25 hours on the move. We're absolutely exhausted. Not surprisingly, we had multiple epics on the abseil descent, as you might expect when you're descending while exhausted in the dark. Stuck ropes, missed anchors, having to climb back up. But yeah, we made it, we're down, we're alive, and what an adventure. If you've got this far, you're probably wondering what on earth went wrong for it to take nearly 26 hours, because nothing that I would have shown you so far looks overly dramatic. And the reality is, there was no major drama, at least not on the way up. It's just a very long, very hard route. There are a few minor route finding errors which delayed us a little bit, but nothing out of the ordinary. I mean, it's the high mountain environment. Getting a little bit lost is part of the course, really. But there's just a lot of pretty hard climbing with a very heavy bag on your back while you're already dehydrated, malnourished, and exhausted. So the route nominally has three 5C ish pitches, and for me, 5C, 6A is pretty much my limit at the crag or down the wall, let alone at nearly 4,000 metres with a heavy bag on your back. So yeah, it's partly why it took so long. If you want to do a route like that anywhere near the guidebook speed, you're going to need several grades in hand really, because to be doing that kind of climbing at that altitude when you're tired, etc., it's going to take you a long, long time. So I knew I was likely to struggle. I said at the start that it's going to be one of the hardest things I've ever done in the high mountains, and it was. But I also knew that by hook or by crook, I was going to get up it one way or another. There's no points for style in the mountains, it's all about getting to the top. Whether that's aiding, dogging, sea tactics, whatever, you just get up. Whatever you, whatever you need to do, you do it, and that's what we did. As it turned out, I actually ended up having to lead most, if not all, of the hard pitches, as my climbing partner was struggling with the altitude. And I was doing all that while having the rope in my bag, because the deal was, he'd be the rope gun, and I'd do the donkey work and carry the heavy rope. So yeah, that also slowed us down a little bit. But I also knew if I, if I couldn't get up it at all, he would be able to do it, but yeah, he just obviously wasn't on form because he hadn't been up at altitude that much this season yet. But to be honest, for me, the hardest bit wasn't one of the 5C pitches. It was actually the pitch after the second 5C pitch, which is normally about 5B, because while they were tough, all the 5C pitches, you could just about aid for every single move. It was still really physical, even if you're putting on gear, but yeah, they were pretty much straight up cracks, so you could place gear on every move if you wanted to. Whereas the pitch afterwards, which I'm referring to, starts off straight crack, a few metres, via a peg, up to a ledge. Then you have to traverse along this ledge, which sounds relatively straightforward, except that the wall above is bulging outwards. So while you can stand up on the ledge to begin with, there's no way you can walk along the ledge. It's going to get pushed off and then take a big swing and a nasty fall. So you basically got to hand traverse this ledge with nothing for your feet. And yeah, I really, really struggle with that pitch. Plus it's hard to protect the second as well. So even if you've got someone else leading it for you, not necessarily going to be any better. So yeah, I really struggled with that pitch. That probably took longer than any of the other 5C pitches really did. Another thing which slowed us down a bit was that we let a French couple overtake us part way up who were planning on to bivvy on the summit. So obviously they were in no hurry anyway, but being French, of course, they could understand and fully interpret a very detailed French topo. Whereas I have quite limited French, so I was having a very piecemeal understanding of what the French topos were saying and the rock facts description is next to useless as always, so yeah, being English is not great. But by that point, we knew we weren't going to get down before dark anyway, so it really made no difference whether we were slowed down a little bit more or not, and it was much better following them because at least they knew where they were going. So yeah. We finally summed to the Grand Drew around about 8 pm, so still enough daylight left to locate the first abseil anchor, but from then on in, the light was deteriorating rapidly. One anchor down, it was pretty much pitched back already, so yeah. Then we had a long, long way to go in complete darkness by head torch. And that's when the drama began. 
Doing full length vertical or indeed sometimes even free hanging abseils is always pretty terrifying even at the best of times, let alone when all you can see is a little bubble of light provided by your head torch and you've got no way of knowing whether you're going to end up at a suitable anchor or not. Luckily the new abseil descent has red cat size by every anchor which in theory makes it easy to find them even in the dark. That's the theory of course but cat size only reflect when you're looking right at them and when you're looking down on them you can't actually see any of them because if it's on a vertical wall you're just seeing the top of whatever will be reflecting and there's nothing there to actually reflect. So yeah, not as easy as it sounds. But at least you can see if you've gone way past one it's way off to the side. Not that you can do anything about it at that point but then yeah on a number of occasions we realised that we were well offline and had to do something about it. We got our ropes up twice while pulling them down. Luckily each time it is relatively straightforward and relatively safe to solo back up to where it was stuck, free it and solo back down again because cutting the rope really isn't an option. Nearly every abseil and descent is 50 metres and we've got 50 metre ropes so even just losing 2 metres of rope you're going to become a cropper. So yeah, we absolutely had to climb back up and free it basically. But the big drama happened about halfway down when my partner got to near the end of the rope, he was expecting a 48 metre abseil and realised that the anchor was maybe 20 metres off to his side and it was on a sheer wall, there was no way that he could get round to it or climb back up again. So he basically made himself safe on a different flake. I came down to the correct anchor and he was hoping that I'd be able to pick him up on my way down again but as he was basically level with the anchor there was no way that I could get across to him either because you can't abseil horizontally. So yeah, genuinely thought we might have to call for rescue at that point but in the end, I managed to get down to a point where I was below him. I could then climb back up, still on the rope, but you're effectively soloing because you get your horizontal with the anchor at that point. But yeah, it was just about easy enough for me to climb up to him so he could lower his thing down. I clipped the rope in, and that way I was safe again because I wasn't going to swing and fall and he could get back on the rope. But yeah, that was, that was the biggest, biggest drama of the whole trip. That took a lot of time, a lot of stress, and yeah, only just managed to get out of that one. And on another instance, much further down, I also missed an anchor by about 20 metres off to the side and realised there was nowhere I was going to get back across to it. But luckily, on the lower bit sections, it's very slabby, quite broken ground, so I was able to, combination of climbing and reascending the rope, get up to a point where I could then get back on the right line again. So yeah, less drama that time, but still it took a lot of energy to climb back up the rope when you're already dehydrated and exhausted. And yeah, it's four in the morning, but we made it, we're alive. Descending the glacier at the end was relatively straightforward and boy was it good when we finally got to some running water again because we were so dehydrated. So yeah, bivvy to bivvy took us about 25 and a half hours in total. So we were awake and on the go for over 26 hours, which is, yeah, absolutely exhausting. Three days later now and I'm still recovering, but it was so worth it. The Drew is one of the most iconic peaks in the Alps, if not the world, and I'm so happy to have climbed it now because who knows, a year or two's time it might fall down so yeah definitely glad to have got suffered and got up it and yeah brilliant experience nonetheless